time. Amen. Good morning. Pastor Gene Aller here at Word of Hope Church, Katie's, Kentucky. We're glad you guys joined us on Facebook and YouTube. And appreciate comments that you send. And, and when you like it, when you share it, it's very important. To help us get the message out. Appreciate the folks here that are in person with us and folks in our church that can't come to the services but watch us and appreciate the faithfulness of this body of believers that, that during this time uh, we've kept up all of our mission support. We've been able to do a lot of things that we've done in the past. There were some things we had to do different, but the Lord has allowed us to get the gospel out in our community more than any year before. Isn't that amazing through the packets and, and through the films that we distributed? Uh, and God has allowed us to reach further through YouTube and Facebook. So God bless all of you. All of you. Amen. Uh, let me encourage you to go ahead and share that now. And I'm going to pray and read some scripture and get started. But uh, amen. Father, we just thank you, Lord, uh, for this past year that's behind us. Lord, in everything, the scripture says, give thanks. And, and I don't know what this past year could have been. We only look back and know what it has been. But, Lord, through it all, we see your hand at work. Through it all, God, we're seeing, Lord, miracles. Through it all, Lord, we're still seeing your move and your presence, Lord, to touch people and heal lives. And, Lord, make a difference in all types of places. And Father, we give you praise and thanksgiving for bringing us through this past year. And now, Lord, as we stand, uh, I guess, on the third day of this new year, looking towards the horizon with great hope and faith and encouragement because we serve you, such a mighty God. Lord, we bless you today, Father. We bless you, Son. We bless you, Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, for your anointing and presence. We pray, God, that this message would bless you, God. Lord, that it would be ordered of you and led of you and directed by you, that, Holy Spirit, you would show up and show mighty in people's lives, God. We we pray, Lord, for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, for the miracle-working power, for the delivering power, for the Spirit infilling and baptism, God. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord, ever steady, Lord. It's just a tower of strength, Lord, to which we look to and cling to and know and hope and put our confidence in. Lord, you said it and we have believed you, God. You are faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, you might want to turn over to Isaiah. You might want to turn to John, the third chapter. You might want to turn to Corinthians. So I don't know where you want to turn to, but I am going to kind of start in Isaiah 43. Not because it's a part of the message, but it does fit. Uh, but I just really felt impressed to read this. So I'm going to read this to our folks and to the folks out there listening to us today. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Isaiah 42. <clears throat> uh, God is prophetically speaking about his son, Jesus. Amen. Jesus wasn't a last-minute thing. The first account of him being talked about is Genesis the third chapter. Immediately after Adam and Eve sinned, God showed up and gave him a promise that this Messiah was going to crush the head of Satan. And I tell you what, he's crushing it. He's crushing. The Lord is crushing the enemy. He crushed him 2,000 years ago on the cross. He crushed him in the tomb. He crushed him with the resurrection. He crushed him while he lived and breathed as a man on this earth. I tell you, he's squeezing the life out of the enemy. And we live in the last days, and it's perilous times, and there's a lot going on. There's wickedness and darkness, but Christ has not lost his power. Amen? So here in the scriptures... God says, Behold my servant who I uphold, my elect in whom my soul delights. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment in truth. What that saying is, he's going to be mighty and powerful, but he's not going to be a loud mouth. He's not going to be a rioter. He's not going to be an anarchist. But he is going to be powerful and make a difference. He's going to bring judgment and truth to our world. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he has set judgment in the earth. And the islands shall wait for his law. 
Thus saith the Lord God, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spreadeth forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them who walk within or therein. You see, every breath of life has come from him. He has empowered and enabled. He has blessed us and filled us. Whether we serve him or not today, whether you know him or not today, whether you love him or hate him today, he gave you life. He gave it to you. He gave you a gift, and he wants you to do something with it that's going to count for eternity. He's made a way for you to get through this world and come into that glorious kingdom to come. And he stretched out the heavens and the earth. Oh, he's a mighty God. Verse 6, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will uphold your hand and will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles to open the blind eyes and to bring out the prisoners from prison and them that sat in darkness out of the prison house. And behold, the four, uh, <clears throat> and I am the Lord that is my name. I am the Lord that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things do I declare. Bring before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Yeah. Sing unto the Lord a new song. And his praise from the ends of the earth. And you shall go down to the sea. And all that is therein. The islands and the inhabitants of them. Let the wilderness and the cities be lifted up. Lift up their voice. And the villages and the inhabitants of the rocks sing. Let them shout from the tops of mountains. Let them give glory unto the Lord. And declare his praise unto the islands. And the Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. And he shall stir up. Uh, jealousy like a man of war and he shall cry yea roar and he shall prevail against his enemies and God said I have long time held my peace I have been still and I have refrained myself now will I cry like a travailing woman and I will destroy and devour at once I will make waste of the mountains and hills I will dry out all their herbs and I will make the rivers islands and I will dry up the pools it's amazing when you read these verses and you see uh, such what appears to be even contradictions to you, but Christ came to bring light into a darkened world. He came to bring hope and a message of love and peace and, and restoration to the Father. But there is coming a time when God will no longer hold his peace and God will come forth in mighty judgment. The scriptures of old have warned us of that. The Messiah told us when he came that it was going to come. He told us what the last days would be like. And folks, we may be very well standing at the threshold of those times, but he'll regard us, our world is in a difficult place. And what is behind us, that's back there. And he's got something new for us. But it does not necessarily mean a trouble-free existence. But it means that we can walk with the Lord. We can dwell with the Lord. That while we're in this world, sometimes struggling, we can still be at peace and have tranquility in the Lord because he is in us and through us for his glory. And he said here, I will bring the blind by a way that they did not know. And I will lead them in the past they have not known. And I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do and not forsake them. That's Isaiah 42, all of it's good, but I'm going to stop right there. God has promised that he's going to do some different things, and I believe we live in an hour of different things. Yeah. In fact, I believe every generation has seen God do new and mighty things. And in the last days, he's promised to pour his spirit out on all flesh. Anybody that wants it, anybody that's hungry, anybody that thirsts, Jesus said, come to me and drink. So we're looking at a new year right now. And uh, the sermon title, the question I'm asking today is what will determine if 2021 is better for you? For most people, for most people in the world, with some exceptions, I'm sure, but for most people in the world, they would want something better this year than last year. Because globally, our world has suffered a great deal. It's not just been an American thing. It's not just been an election thing and a ploy by politicians to control the masses and, and divert everything going on. It's been global. It's not just America. It's global, you understand. Katie, when she was traveling in Africa and 
several countries that she went to and then ultimately uh, back into Korea. She said, Dad, she said, everywhere I go, everybody has bought into that. At the time she was traveling, a lot of people were saying that uh, the COVID wasn't real, that when, as soon as the election ended, that it would all go away. That would be the end of it. And she said they managed to fool the whole world. You see, this has been a global thing. Has it been used politically? Oh, absolutely. Has there been leveraging and taking advantage of some things? Oh, yeah. Oh, we have some problems in our nation. And this kind of pressure brings out those problems. And we have had riots, and we have had business failures, and we, we have seen tough times this past year. But it's the whole world, people. And I, I think everybody in the world pretty well would say, oh my, I want 2021 to be a better year. Yeah. Now there's some that have prospered. There's some that probably made a lot of money making and selling masks this past year. I don't know. You know, yeah, I think it's Thailand that uh, produces a lot of masks and they gave them away. They gave them away to the countries of the world that could not afford them. There was one shipment, I saw a YouTube thing about it, nine million masks that they were sending to a poor country. There's been some people that have reached out and loved and made a difference in other people's lives, even if the costs are lost of finances. There's been a lot of things, a lot of sacrifices this past year, a lot of losses of people and things and even hopes and dreams and futures and a lot of questions left over from this past year. We still have issues, of course, that are still lingering uh, before us even right now. What's going to determine if 2021 is better for you? I think that's an important question. I think God has an answer for that. I think he has a way through the most difficult times for his people. He could take those crooked paths and make them straight. He could take the blind and give them sight. He can do in darkness. He can bring forth light. David said in the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. David didn't say I'm never going to go through the valley of the shadow of death. David didn't say I'm never going to face my enemies. In fact, he said in that same Psalms 23, that you have prepared a table before me in the face of my enemies. The problems are real. The difficulties are real. The struggles are real. But God is real. Amen. He's still in control. He's still on the throne. And God is still for people. And let me say this. God is not just for his people. He's reaching out. He's calling. The Holy Spirit is drawing and compelling, uh, convicting, Amen. compelling people to come to him. And that's the job of the church, to be about the Father's business. And I'm praying that year 2021 will be a year of great evangelism, great outreach, and great ministry. Amen. Local church, but also at the filling station, at the Walmart, at the neighbor's house, in the backyard, over the fence, wherever we go, that we'll share the good news of the love of Jesus to a lost and dying, darkened world. If you're a believer today, whether you know it or not, whether your face shows it or not, you carry the hope of the world within you if you're born again. You have the answer. You have the solution. Not because you know the answer. Not because you know the solution. But because you live in fellowship and close contact with Jesus. Amen. With Jesus. The one who calmed the sea and raised the dead, cleansed the leopard, opened the blind eyes. Who stilled the waters. Oh my goodness, when you've got Jesus, you've got something. But you've got to let him out. What will determine if 2021 is better for you? Most people would say 2021 will be better if my circumstances are better. 2021 would be better if somebody treated me better. Talked better about me. In 2021, if my family loved me more, or maybe in 2021, if I had a family, I'd be better. If I got an increase on my job, all these things are things that we're looking to to make 2021 better. And I'm not saying God doesn't bless and do things, but my goodness, you see what you have when everything is gone. You see what you have in Christ when you're restricted, when you can't do what you want to do, when you suffer the loss of some freedom, when things are not like they used to be, when you have to live outside of your comfort zone, when, you know, there's fear on every corner. You see what you really have in Christ when things aren't going well. And so 
from that perspective, we can look at our lives and we can say, wow, in 2021, I want to be connected to the rock. I want to be more connected to that which is immovable and unshakable, that that will not change, that that will not waver, that that will not compromise. Amen. Yeah, in 2021, for most people, if my circumstances were better, if I was loved more by somebody, if I was respected more by somebody, if things just looked up in my business world or whatever, you know, we all want the world to be a better place. I think everybody wants that. We want the world to be a better place, and that's important. In John's Gospel, the third chapter, I told you you might want to turn to John. John's, John's Gospel, the third chapter. Hopefully I got this right. <clears throat> I was having cut and pasting problems this morning. <laughs> this is the verdict. And I think uh, we're using the new NIV here. John 3.16, you know by heart, but this is John 3.19 through 21. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. And everyone who does hates, uh, and everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whosoever lives by the truth comes into the light. So it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. And that is the NIV, John's Gospel, third chapter. You see, we live in a dark world. And Isaiah, when I read that a while ago, like I say, it wasn't part of the sermon, but when I was singing that song, The Days of Elijah, how I many of you like that song? And uh, Tina, when she was singing that a while ago, I was swaying in my chair back there typing my sermon stuff. And, and I thought, man, I love that song. Youth groups, uh, when my wife used to do drama with kids, they would, she would uh, do that song and turn it into a, uh, I guess, a human video, she called it. And, and the kids would, would have moves and things that went with that song. Faith remembers those days of doing it and teaching other kids to do it. And all that was cool. But uh, in that song, it talks about he came to shine a light into the darkness. He came to lighten the way of the Gentile. He came to lighten the eyes of the blind. And Jesus is that light of the world. And the world doesn't love Jesus. You understand that? The world doesn't always love him, but he still loves them. Yeah, if you're watching today, and uh, you know, you probably aren't. But if you're watching today and you're a Christ hater, I want to tell you, Christ still loves you. If you're watching today and you're bitter at God and you, you're upset at God because something didn't go like maybe it should have went and you think somehow that's God's fault, I tell you it's not God's fault, but, but you've gotten bitter against God, he still loves you. It would be strange to think, but it does happen. Maybe you're watching today on YouTube or maybe 10 years from now you'll see this message and for some reason look at it and, and you don't believe in God. I want to tell you, you're not believing in God doesn't stop his loving you, doesn't stop him dying for you, doesn't stop him from shedding his blood 2,000 years ago so that you might know him. No, I tell you what, uh, we like the darkness. The world likes the darkness. But a believer, oh my, we've been brought into the light. There's something different about us. Not just, uh, you know, a, a, an affiliation or an association or a membership. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a relationship with the Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ, the Son, who died for us to restore us to our rightful place with the Father. And I tell you, the Lord looks at the world and he calls out, come on to me. Come to me, all you that are heavy laden and burdened, I'll give you rest. Come to him today. Forsake the false gods. And I, in Isaiah 42, we were reading, Father down it talks about their idols, worship of their idols. Forsake those idols. To serve the Lord only. Yeah, the Lord came to bring light into the world, to expose things, but to make things so that we had a direction to go so we would have understanding and wisdom. In John 9, 3 through 5. John 9, 3 through 5. Here Jesus said this. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who has sent me. Night is coming when no man can work. While I am in the world, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. 
And so Jesus reveals himself many places in the gospel as the glorious light of the, Lord, of, of the world, as, as God's light that's come into a dark world. Also, in the writings of Paul, it talks about that glorious light of Jesus. And Jesus here is on an occasion, uh, chapter 9 of the Gospel of John. And this man was born blind. His disciples wanted to know if it was his father, his parents' father. Jesus said, no, 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 but so that you would see the works of God. That didn't mean that God blinded him so Jesus would come heal him. It meant they encountered a blind man and Jesus had the answer. And Jesus was going to heal him. And indeed, he did heal him. But the religious people got mad. The church got upset in his day. The synagogue uh, didn't like it. And Jesus healed a man that had never been, had this same miracle he healed a man that had been born blind. And they said that had never happened before. It's this life. I, I want to tell you something. Circumstances in your life matter. We'll get to that in a minute. But God is more concerned about what's going on in you than on you. And we don't like that. But God is more concerned about what's going on in me than to me. God is more concerned about who I am in him than who I am in the eyes of the world and those around us. And those things are important, but it goes against the grain of the carnal man. It goes against the grain of the religious spirit. But it doesn't go against the grain of the true and living church of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians, if you want to scroll over that direction a little ways. 1 Corinthians. You all okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Where's he going to go? Well, I don't know. I got all kinds of stuff here that I'll never read to you. Won't be able to get to you. But the Lord just does that. 1 Corinthians 2, chapter 1. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. If Ron was here today, he'd be, he'd be shaking his head at me because I'm always giving the wrong address. That's so you guys will learn the Bible on your own. When I give you the wrong place, hey, right? Where is that in the Bible? I just type wrong sometimes. Yeah, I see it different than you do. All right, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1. Paul said, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellency of speech or wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The most important thing for you to know is Jesus and him crucified. Jesus Christ. Jesus the man, Emmanuel, Christ, the Savior of the world, and him crucified. He died so you could live. And that's so important. That's so critical. That's what the gospel is. And Paul said in verse 3, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, neither are mine. But in demonstration of spirit and of power, that your faith might not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. We've got to put everything in the power of God. We've got to have our hope, our confidence. We've got to face the problems that are coming up in our life in the year 2021 in faith in God, knowing that he's going to take care of us. It's not going to take the wisdom of man. In fact, the wisdom of man will not be able to fix some of the things we're going to go through this year. But God can. Amen. God can. Amen. It's not in, you know, uh, the smooth words. It's not in the profound teachings of human wisdom that sometimes is pawned off as spiritual insight. How many of you know that happens some? Not everything that sounds good is good. Hello? Yeah. So that your faith would not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Your faith can stand in the power of God, not in man. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. He's assuming that we're mature in the Lord. God make us mature. And we speak wisdom to those who are mature. Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age or this world who are coming to nothing. How many of you know that the political systems, that the world systems, that all these things uh, are going to come to nothing at some time? And every day some of those things come to nothing anyway. Throughout the ages, there's always the ending of things. And so this world system is going to be uh, finished one of these days. 
Wonder if the Lord returns this year. Wonder if we go into seven years of tribulation, the great tribulation. Wonder if we go through a season and end up at the battle of Armageddon. Wonder if the Antichrist appears on the scene and, and starts marking and, and uh, you know, making demands upon people on what they can buy, sell, and eat. You have to take the mark of the beast. Wonder if those things happen very shortly. I don't guess anybody wants to hear that. We want to hear that it's going to be my greatest year ever, and it can be. But if it is because your circumstances are better, you're in a mess. Because your circumstances may fail you one day, but God will not. He wants us to have our hope in Him, not in the wisdom of this world, not in the systems of this world. We live here, we're a part of here, but we're a part of another kingdom if we're born again. And if you don't know Christ and you're watching today, you can know Him. He's not hard to find. He's been looking for you all your life. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the ages for our glory to be revealed to us. Verse 8, which none of the rulers of this age knew. Paul talking about his time. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They would not have crucified Christ if they realized what was really going on. Because when they crucified him, they thought they won. When, when, the, when they beat him uh, in the garden or, and they pulled the, the, the beard, the hair out of his face and they beat a crown of thorns on him at Pilate's Hall and Herod's Hall, when they gave him 39 strikes and when he drove across two miles down the Via Della Rosa, when they drove nails in his hands and feet and stood up that cross, thumping it into the ground, tearing his flesh, when his blood poured out, when he cried, I thirst. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you, God? Well, the rulers of this world and the darkened world as well as probably the political system of his day, they thought they had accomplished something. The Jewish leaders had said it's expedient that one man die, that the whole nation be saved. Barabbas, the criminal, the murderer, was set free, so Christ was crucified in his place as the custom was. They all fall that they had accomplished something, but they had not. Their victory became their defeat. His death became our victory. His resurrection, our empowerment. You see, Christ is alive today, and he's able to carry you through any storm that life might throw at you, through any difficulty that might arise, through anything that might go wrong. Christ in you is the hope of glory. You can depend upon Christ. In good days, oh yeah, that's easy but in tough times as well. Amen. We need Jesus. Yes. We need Jesus. And the trial of your faith, that's the difficult times that you go through by faith. That's what builds your character and who you are in Christ according to the scriptures. The trial of your faith is much more precious than gold and silver that perishes. So important. Well, if they had known what they were doing, if the demons had known, if Satan had understood, if the Ruling powers of that day had known they would not have crucified Christ because Peter said it was not possible that death could hold him. And because he lives, I'll live also. Amen. Because he lives, I'm living and will live. But it is written, eyes not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. So one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible, people read that and they say, well, you can't understand. No, no, the rulers of this world could not understand. Uh, the demons could not understand. Satan did not understand. The false religious representatives could not understand. Rome could not understand. The fallen church could not understand. But oh my goodness, there were people like Anna who spent her lifetime in the temple of God praying. And when Jesus, baby Jesus came in, she knew who he was. She knew who he was. Oh, my goodness. It's the Lord. It's Jesus. It's the Messiah for the fallen rise of many people. Simeon was not at the temple in that moment, but he was a godly man of prayer. And the Spirit summons him to the temple. And when he came in the door, he said, oh, my. He said, it's the one I've been looking for. God said, I'd never die until I saw him. And now I know I can go rest in peace because I have seen him. I've beheld him. I want to tell you, some people recognize who Jesus is. No, he's not a baby anymore. And he's not uh, just a man on the earth anymore. 
And he's not in a tomb anymore. He's not crucified anymore. He was crucified. He was in a tomb. He was dead, but now he's alive and alive forevermore. The beginning and the end. He is the hope of the ages. He's the only way through this world, no matter what the world offers. And he has a kingdom where he's calling his people to. But when you know Christ, you can come to know the reality of living in the presence of God in difficult times. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote Corinthians from prison. Paul did his best writing from prison. How many of you know there's a lot of time there? He had a lot of time in prison, so he wrote. Actually, Paul didn't write a lot of his own stuff because he was beaten and broken up and chained so much that Luke and other people did the writing for Paul. They would visit him and bring him food because in Roman prisons, food was a luxury, not a right in Paul's time. So they would try to take care of him best they could. And he pins these incredible words. You see, Paul knew what it was to have a deep, abiding, personal, up-to-date, thriving relationship with Jesus when he was bleeding, when he was sweating, when he was freezing, when he was chained. Because it was Christ in him, not the stuff on him, not the stuff being done to him. Not the valley he was walking through or the fire he was passing through or the waters that he was swimming through when he was shipwrecked in the ocean three times. Oh, no, it was Christ in him. And that's what we've got to have, people. Believers, there is room in your life for more Christ. Amen. Christ has got to fill us up so we float, so to speak. We've got to be so filled with him that we can live in heavenly places despite sickness and disease, attacks of the enemy, lies and things we don't understand and misunderstand, despite the difficulties of this world, good, bad, or indifferent, we need Christ so dwelling in us richly, Paul said, Christ in us richly, so that we are able to sustain through all those things with victory anyway. I would like to promise you that the circumstances of year 2021 were going to be the greatest ever in your life. That everything was going to go good. That your car would never run out of gas. Fill it up once for the year. That the utility bill would be over with. That your job would increase your pay and decrease your hours. That your kids would love you and come over and clean your house for you. <laughs> oh my goodness. That the grandkids would just think you were the greatest thing ever. That next Christmas you'd have to buy a warehouse to store all the gifts that people give to you. I'd like to promise you the year... 2021, that instead of getting a year older, you'd get 20 years younger. Now, those of you that are extremely young would not want that. And I would have to say for me, as strange as it'll sound, I'm not wanting to get any younger. I'm running a race. And I'm wanting to get to the end of this thing as God wills. But nonetheless, I wish I could say there would be no more masks. There would be no more COVID. There would be no more sickness or disease or poverty or struggles in our world. That every single thing you put your hand to, no matter what, would prosper. And there would never be a setback or a disappointment or a hurt feeling or a misspoke word or a miscommunication. That all of the wounds from the years gone by would really be washed away and totally healed. That your enemies would love you and you would love them. I wish I could promise that this would be the year where every step you take, you see his shadow walking with you. I wish I could promise you no more troubles, no more tears, no more problems this year. For some, that will become a reality because they'll go live with the Lord this year. Praise God. I'm looking forward to that. Revelation talks about a time when he's going to do all that in the lives of his children. Where he's going to wipe away all the tears and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But in this life, there are some perilous times. And so 2021 may not be the best year in your circumstances possibly. Who thought 2020 would be what it was? Hello? Yeah. Did anybody go back and listen to last year's prophecies? I did. <laughs> they didn't have 2020. Now, there were a few things that did talk about some stuff. And in hindsight, I could say, yeah, that fits in there. But uh, a lot of that stuff didn't happen. I'm not putting down the prophets. Thank God for the prophets. I listened to some this morning. I got excited with Kent Christmas, you know. Put a little, I told him I need a little bounce in my step this morning, dragging through the building. So, yeah. so I put him on. Had him on yesterday. And some other people. And I read some stuff from Kenneth Copeland's ministry yesterday. I mean, I mean, I, but do you understand that uh, 
Sometimes tough times come. And it's Christ in you that's going to make the difference. And the thing about that that's so uh, amazing, I can't always change my circumstances. I, I, I can't always make my car work. I can't always make the kids love me, keep the dog from biting me. Maybe. But I can always draw nearer to the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, he's already in me. I just need a realization of who I am in Christ. Does that make sense? You know, you're not half saved or quarter saved or full saved. But a lot of times we're still coming from that world's wisdom that, that, you know, they crucified Christ. But the world's wisdom did not understand what God was doing. And so they didn't receive from God in the scriptures we're reading here. But eyes not seen, ears not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those that love him. And, 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 and that's even where most believers live, right there. They quote the verse, I find sermons, and they don't read the next verse. When you read the Bible, try reading more than a verse. And when you read the Bible, try reading more than part of a verse sometimes. You don't try to read a page of the thing. It won't hurt you. The next verse, which, by the way, was not divided in numbers when it was written. It's just a long letter. But Paul has revealed them to us through his spirit. God's got some things he wants to reveal to his people in this upcoming year. Now, let me say something that a lot of folks won't like. Some of what God wants to reveal to you and me this next year will not be positive because he wants his people to know what's coming. You understand? He wants them to know what's coming. But God's plans for you are good, even in the midst of the storm. We preached a couple of weeks ago, uh, Jeremiah 29, that right? 29, 11, or 11, 29. I get it backwards all the time. It is the most, one, of, one of the most known Quoted and wrote on pictures and books and any other, and I always get the location wrong. So anyway, that verse, I know the thoughts I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and give you a hope-filled future. Plans to not do you evil or harm you, depending on the translation. But that is in the midst of a chapter where the children of Israel are in slavery for 70 years and they ain't through yet. And the prophets were telling them it's all done, it's all over. That's exactly right. And God told Jeremiah, no, you tell them in the midst of this, I have plans for them. They've got a future. I'm going to take care of them. But it's not ending yet. And he said, I'm going to judge the prophets. And he even mentioned some by name in Jeremiah's day. I tell you what, our hope has got to be in God and not what people say. Now, I'd say I'm not disregarding the prophets. I love them and and they've helped me, and I learned things. But, you know, not everything that's on YouTube, we used to say on the Internet, not everything on YouTube is true. And there are going to be some struggles in 2021. But it can be your best year ever. It can be between you and Christ. It can be thriving in the Lord this next year. Have I got much time left here? But God has revealed what he's going to do, those things that he's prepared for those who love him. Those who love him. It's important we learn to love him. I, it's been a big prayer of mine this year. Lord, help me love you more. I, I think there's room for me to love God more. I, I really believe he loves me completely. <laughs> but I'm not sure that I don't ever waver in my love for him. It's something you might think about sometimes. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all the things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man that's within him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. And then verse 12, but we have received not the Spirit of the world, not that Spirit. Sometimes as believers, we're highly motivated by the Spirit of the world. But the Spirit who is from God, you see, we have access to that Holy Spirit, that we might know, God wants us to know, the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which men's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet himself is rightly judged by no one. For, he, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? questions. Well, it says, but we have the mind of Christ if you're born again. 
So I don't have all the answers of what's going to come up in 2021. One of the prophecies was that the largest meetings would be held in 2020 for the gospel. All over the country, they were booking coliseums for the gospel. The year of the stadium. Now that term's being used again now for this year. And that's okay. I pray that it happens. But that, you know what happened this past year? More meetings got canceled than ever before. More services got canceled. More churches set empty. More coliseums were never filled. Cancellations took place. I'm not putting anybody down. I'm just saying that you and I need to have our whole fully firm on Christ and the Word of God and not just what people are saying. We need to be tied into God's Word. I believe it's going to be a great year. I believe in declaring and saying things, but I realize we live in what the Scripture says is troubled times in the last days, and difficulties are still here. And when you and I are out in this world, He's called us to be light in a dark world, to show love and kindness, and to be hope to other people. When times are tough, they can look at us, and we have a reason for living. We have a reason for joy and peace in our lives, because our hope is in Christ and not in circumstances. You understand, all of these things are circumstances, and they're subject to change. And you know what? Ten people in this room can have great circumstances, and somebody else have not so great. But we can all have the same thing in Christ. We can all dwell in the same place in Christ. We can all be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. We can all walk in the love and the mercy and the grace of God every day, even with some of the things that we thought were never going to happen do happen. Hello? Got quiet now. We always want to hear that everything's going to be better. That's what Jeremiah's message is. Oh, God had him say a lot of things in difficult times. Yep, I'm praying for COVID to go, for elections to be resolved, for racial problems in our nation to be put to rest. I don't mean, by the way, ignored. I mean dealt with and, and, and changes be made. I, I pray for the economics of our nation to get back on solid ground, uh, for us to turn around and be a godly nation, a nation where our schools share the good news and don't keep kids from wearing T-shirts to talk about Jesus. I'm praying for our nation to be a world where babies aren't martyred or babies aren't aborted. I'm praying for our nation to be a place where prayer and Bible reading and pledge allegiance to the flag is allowed in all the schools of our nation again. I'm praying for our nation to be a place of true equal opportunity for anybody, no matter who they are or where they came from. I'm praying for our nation to be a place that's known that loves God and loves people. Loves God and loves people. A nation that cares about other nations. Amen. I want our nation to be the light of the world. And we've gone through some tough times. Some things have been exposed. Some things have come to surface. Empty words have been challenged and fallen flat. But the gospel of Jesus Christ still moves on. The voice of the Lord is still powerful. He still has a plan for this hour. And he wants his people right in the middle of that. God is more concerned about what's going on in you than he is on what's going on around you. And we don't like that. We want him to fix all our problems today. Now, does God fix problems? Yeah. Does he answer prayers? Does he open blind eyes? Yep. Does he heal the sick? Does he save the lost? Does he meet needs? He does. But God's people go through difficult times. All who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And in America, we've gotten a dose of what most of the world lives under. In America, we've had to see some things we never thought we would see. And that's not all bad. Please understand, there's an opportunity there for God to raise our compassion level for those in the world that are suffering in ways that we never thought about realistically. We face some things and some conflicts and struggles. And, and even the politics of our nation is still in an upheaval right now. The election is passed, but it's still going on. Uh, this week, a very important week. And, and uh, when they bring forth the electorals and bring that to the committee and, and Vice President Pence. And oh my goodness, there's real potential for struggle to come out of that. And some are calling for, and I'm calling for, times of fasting for the next few days. Amen. That we would fast and pray Amen. and seek God. What is yeah. fasting? Well, biblical fasting by and large is abstaining from food and drinking water. Daniel's fast is mentioned in Daniel. And that is the eating of pretty much uh, on 
you know, no, no meat, no sugars, no, uh, you know, caffeine, no wine, no, you know, just plain, simple vegetables, I think, pretty well. And that's not a good analysis of the Daniel Fast, fast but it's, uh, it's very minimal eating that a lot of people practice. Some people practice fasting technology. Don't turn your phone off right now. We're not done. And uh, other things. But uh, it seems to be a week of prayer in our nation for all kinds. Amen. We ought to start this year off in seeking God. Amen. God, what is it you're wanting to do in my life? In my life. God is more concerned about what's in me than on me. More concerned about what's in me than what's being done to me. Does that make sense to you? Did he love Paul when he was in prison? Absolutely. But did Paul suffer? Absolutely. Now Paul said, I've become a scourge of the earth for you all. He said, we paid this price so you all wouldn't have to. I mean, that is in the context of some scriptures. But we have believers all over the world that are losing their life. Does your circumstances matter to God? Yes, they do. God does care. Jesus looked out over Jerusalem and wept. Jesus came to Mary and Martha at Lazarus' funeral, and he wept. God is the God of compassion. He cares. God's desire is for the world to be way better off than it is today. But our rejection of him, our rejection in this world of God has brought us to a place of destruction. Our rejection of Christ in our world today, the disregarding of his word, the grieving of his Holy Spirit, the rejecting of the gospel message, the hating of God and his people that brought such great destruction in our world. The return in September, our church hosted that. All oh, that we would repent and return to God. Uh, you know, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. That that would be our true prayer for us. Not for everybody else, but for us to do that. Philippians 4, verse 11. We're getting close to the end. Somebody said amen. Go back to the beginning, Pastor. We shouted and smiled a little then. Don't like this part of it so much. Philippians 4.11. Now, Paul talking here. He said, not that I speak in regard to need. Paul's talking about things in his life. And he said, but I'm not saying things like this because I have need. For I have learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. And that doesn't mean Kentucky or Arkansas. His condition. The circumstances of my life, Paul said, I've learned to be content. What was it? that enabled Paul to be content? What was it that mattered so much to Paul that he kept going and going and going and preaching and sharing and suffering and loving and preaching and ministering, even though he himself was being treated unbelievably poor many times, beaten and talked about and drugged by horses and on and on the list goes. Oh my goodness. Colossians Chapter 1, verse 27. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul said, it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's Christ in you, the hope. Christ in you that gives hope to the world around us. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, but he's called you and I to be light and salt. It is Christ in you. That's something that will overpower your circumstances. Christ in you will keep you on the bad days. Christ in you will keep you in the times you don't understand or don't agree or you're all alone. It'll keep you on days when God seems a million miles away. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Christ wants to be in us richly, so fully. Hebrews, the third chapter, verse 6. But Christ is the son over his own house whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. No matter what's going on, it says that we are his house. <laughs> he is Christ as a son over the house, whose house we are. We are the body of Christ, the house of the Lord if you're born again. And he's the son over that house. He's Christ the Messiah, and he calls us to hold fast the confidence and rejoicing, not the complaining or the fussing or the whining, but hold fast our confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Before you see it, believe it. Amen. 
That's what he's saying. It's a hope that we have, Paul said, as he writes from prison. <laughs> he said, I've got a confidence. I've got rejoicing because of my hope that I have in Christ, the son over the house. I am his body. He is my head. And how do we understand this? He is the bridegroom, and we are the bride. We are his church. We are his building. We are his people. We have to keep our confidence and rejoicing in this great hope that we have firmly to the very end of the age or the end of our lives or the end of unpleasant circumstances. Jesus came to see life, to teach me, to show me how to see life, through the eternal eyes of the Heavenly Father. He wants us to see life through eternity. He wants us to see living through eternal life, not just in this world. I probably ought to close, but I'll go just a little longer. Got communion in a few minutes. <clears throat> Hanging in a convenience store somewhere is a picture of the, the, the uh, Blue Angels. That's the Navy's uh, F-16, is that what they are? Fighter plane squadron that flies and does all those maneuvers. I had the privilege of seeing them in Pensacola, Florida years ago. And they fly in formation. And so it's a picture of them, you know, coming up and flaring and the smoke coming out the back and their wings are 18 inches apart, flying at several hundred miles an hour, I assume. And the sign says, your attitude, not your aptitude, will determine your altitude. Your attitude... Not your aptitude will determine your altitude. Attitude is what you think, feel, and believe about something. Aptitude is the natural ability and talents that you might have. They can be increased through learning and developing new skills, but aptitude has a limit for us as people. <clears throat> altitude is how high you will fly. Al altitude, how high you will fly. If you're going to soar with the eagles, you've got to have an attitude that comes from the cross. Yeah. If you're going to soar with the eagles, you've got to let Christ dictate, show, give you the mind of Christ. We talked about the world couldn't understand it in Corinthians. And Isaiah 42 doesn't make sense to the carnal mind, but to the child of God that has the mind of the Lord, to whom the Spirit has revealed things, we have an attitude that allows us to have faith. We have an attitude that allows us to believe differently about things that are going on in our lives. We have an attitude that says, this life is not who I am. What I have is not who I am. The length of my life is not the most important thing in this world. But I have another world. I'm a part of another kingdom. I've been born again by the incorruptible seed of the word of God. And so I think different about what I see. I feel different about what I'm going through. I believe different than people around me. My personal abilities, my aptitude might be really high like the Apostle Paul's or it might be really low like somebody else. But it doesn't matter because Christ in us empowers us through the knowledge of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to know things supernaturally given by God, to know the times and the seasons, to understand that God is doing something and we're able to find God in the midst of the storm. We're able to find hope and peace and comfort and share that with other people because Christ in us is the hope of the glory. And because of that, we fly to a high altitude. We soar over so many things. No, our bodies are in this world. We do deal with the problems of this life, but we've been invited. The scripture says literally we've been seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are allowed to view this world with a heavenly perspective, with Christ in us and through us. And even when circumstances are bad and difficult, you and I can still cling to the Lord and know that he's going to take care of us. God is so faithful. Thank you, Jesus. Now, <clears throat> what you allow to determine your attitude will determine how good this year is going to be to you. What you allow to determine your attitude will determine how you see this upcoming year. Circumstances can change by outside forces, people, weather, economy, things just happen, flat tires, business closed, the loss of things, and sometimes the loss of others. Circumstances control most people's lives by affecting what's going on from the outside to the inside. 
I mean, if everything's working out good, they're joyful. If the car won't start and the dog runs away and they lose their job, they're not joyful. I understand that those things play, put weight upon us and we struggle. But when we're a believer, when we're born again, when we're resting solely in Christ, circumstances don't keep us down very long. We have a hope. So faith is what we believe. Faith is what you believe. Faith and attitude go hand in hand. Faith is what we believe. Attitude, what you believe, will determine uh, what you think and feel about things. Well, faith allows us to think and feel and believe according to the Word of God. We're going to have ups and downs in this life, but we have a confidence because of faith. Our attitude is a faith attitude, and that causes us to soar even when times are tough. It causes us to be okay when things are not okay. It enables us to get through the valley of the shadow of death with confidence in God. It allows us to become a Gideon if God needs us or a David if God calls us. It allows us to do suffering and difficulties like Paul and the apostles went through if it's necessary. Because we have faith, our attitude is higher than those that don't have faith. We soar so differently. We look at life so differently. Faith is seen by our conversation. By the way, we talk about circumstances. Do we talk about this past year, sickness, disease, distrust of government, disunity, uncertainty of our future, restrictions, masks, hand sanitizer? That was the conversation of this past year for so many, even us as a household of faith that came into play. But we can stand in faith on the promises of God, by faith, believing that what God has said in his word, he's going to do regardless of our daily circumstances. Knowing that when times are tough, God's still with me. I'm not alone. You know the footprints in the sand where God carries us, uh, that sign we see so often. Circumstances don't have to determine how we feel. We can learn through the word of God our identity in Christ to know that Christ is with us. And when times are tough, we have a hope-filled future. We can talk about and say the things that Christ said. We can speak the words of life. We can speak words of faith and encouragement in a dark and dying world. Despite what's going on, the church can be, the believer can be the voice of reason in Christ. The voice of hope and peace in difficult times. We can be the voice and the action of love when other people don't have any to give. We can be people that do have joy on the tough days because Christ dwells in us so richly. What will make your life and my life better this year? Well, if everything worked out just like we wanted, that would be good. But that's not where my hope is. My hope is in Christ. And I will be all right this year. I will do good in Christ. I will have an attitude of faith. My aptitude, which is not all that great, if you look at the natural skills and ability, has been enhanced by the power of the Holy Spirit, giving me knowledge and revelation and wisdom. His word is the voice that I have. I can speak the promises of God when the storm rages. I can say peace. Amen. When sickness is everywhere, I can say be healed. You know, we can stand on his word and his promises. In closing, Mark 9, 23, when they brought a demon-possessed boy that the disciples could not set free, that the Jewish exorcists couldn't help, that there was no hope for, apparently, brought him to Jesus, and Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. All things are possible. So the year 2021, I, I don't know. Maybe all the problems will just go away in this week or next week or next month. Maybe this will turn out to be in every account for the saved and unsaved, for the nations of the world. Maybe this will be the greatest year of all humanity from a secular and Christian point of view. But if it's a year that has storms and difficulties and losses and troubles, I want to be prepared for that in Christ. I want to be hearing the voice of the Lord in my life for my family and this church and you know, I, I want to be an example of light and love and hope so that lost people, when it's so bad, will know where to come so they can get help, so they can find Christ. You know, I, I want to be prepared for whatever comes my way. I'm optimistic. Don't think I'm not. But I just don't know everything that's going to happen. I never thought last year, 2020, would be what it was. 
not in my wildest dreams. I never thought there would come a day that, that I would pass through a church and allow its doors to stay closed for months. Never would I believe that. Never would I believe a lot of things that I saw this past year. And honestly, if the prophets had stood up January 1 and told us all that stuff, nobody would have watched them. Their YouTube following would have went to three. Them, the wife, and the mom. Nobody would have wanted to hear that. Am I right? Well, I am right, whether you shake your head or not. Because we always want to hear how good it's going to be. And I want to tell you, in Christ, it is good. But that don't mean troubles don't come. It don't mean we don't bury our lost ones. I took Debbie down seven years ago and buried her be eight years soon. It don't mean we don't go through hard times and things don't fall apart and jobs don't end. I'm not preaching to them and gloom. I'm just telling you that our whole, all of it's got to be in Christ, not in the circumstances of this world. Because I don't know what they look like. Jesus said last days aren't going to be good. I don't know. I think he knew what he was talking about. Does anybody think he knew what he was talking about? Are we there? I don't know. The prophets don't know either. They all have different opinions, and, and we don't know. We may be living at that hour at the end of the age. But he said to the child of God, we can look up and rejoice because the completion. He said redemption draws near, but it's the completion of our salvation. Amen. Someday I'm going to fly. I'm going to fly away. But I'm not an escapist wanting to get out, really. I want to share that good news with some other people. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to take communion now. You've got your cup. Get that ready. And I realize it's a little after 12 People don't really complain here when I go past 12. I'm the one that always complains about it. Trying to hedge you off before you do, I guess. I remember one Wednesday night, two people were visiting here. One lady went out the door after an hour and 15 minute sermon, and she said, Oh my goodness. She said, I could listen to that all the time. She never came back, but. <laughs> Another lady right behind her, a visitor, they didn't know each other. She said, oh my goodness. She said, I got more preaching tonight than I'll get in my church all next month. And she never came back either. So I don't know what either one of them meant. But they did get some Bible. How many of you know you heard the Bible and you heard my poor uh, words added to it, trying to do what God wanted? And I think there's a lot of truth in there that you can live with. 2021, yeah, we're praying for this to be the greatest year ever. But I want it to be the greatest year ever in my relationship with Christ. Amen. Christ. Amen. Above all, in all, through all. That's what I want this to mean for me. You choose what you want, I guess. Well, we're going to take communion today. And, and uh, most time we make a whole service out of it. It is something to be reverenced. Something to, to do not lightly, but to, to look at and realize that bread symbolizes uh, his broken body. His body was broken for me. Real suffering. Was it made less because he's Emmanuel, God with us? Was it made less because he, he knew he was going to resurrect? Because he knew he was going to resurrect by faith, you understand? He knew by faith he was going to. It's the only way he could know because he lived by faith that he was the son of God. And, uh, they beat him, and they broke his body. No bones were broken, but his body was broken, and it fulfilled the scriptures. And this juice that we drank representing that blood that was shed, the precious blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. There's no hope. No other religion can save you. Only Christ alone died on the cross for your sins. Only he rose from the dead for your justification. Christ's blood alone. This is the only way to atone for sins. Not in the taking of these elements, but in the taking of Christ as your Lord and Savior and Master of your life. So right now as we bow our heads and pray, you on YouTube, and I forgot to tell you, but you can get water or cracker, whatever you might have, and take communion with us if you want to. You don't have to be a member of this group. You just have to be a member of the body of Christ. If you made Christ Lord, if you haven't, ask him in your heart today. Ask him to forgive you. Make a total commitment to live your life for God as he leads you and directs you. Get in a, a spirit-filled Bible-preaching church somewhere when you can. 
Let's pray. Lord, we, we ask you right now, search our own hearts. See, as David said, is there any wicked way within us? Lord, as Paul said in Corinthians, we don't want to partake unworthily. And we realize that that is not meant to keep us from partaking. It's meant for us to examine and where needed, ask forgiveness. And so, Lord, right now we examine our hearts. We ask you, God, to show us is there something we need to confess. And, and Lord, we, we do that. It's a choice each individual makes for themselves. I can't do it for them. So if you're here today or you're watching and, and there's some area of your life that you know is not right, then I ask you to ask God to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us. To as many as receive him, to them he gives power to become sons and daughters of God. He's for you. He's not trying to exclude you. He's wanting to include us and the body. This bread represents his body, and it represents the body of Christ as the body of Christ worldwide, the church. We are his body. He is the head. We are the members. Lord, we ask you, as we've searched our hearts, and ask your forgiveness as needed. Lord, we ask that you would bless this bread. Lord, I break it between my fingers, symbolically remembering your body broken for me. Remembering what you did, remembering what you're doing. Remembering that you're coming back someday, not with a broken body, but King of kings and Lord of lords, victorious, a king, a warring king. Lord, we love you, Jesus. We thank you for taking stripes so we could be healed, for taking a beating for our peace of mind, for bringing forgiveness to our sins. Lord, we thank you and we ask you to bless this bread to the nourish our bodies. Let's partake together. Now, the cup, this juice representing his blood, he said it would be shed for the remissions of sins of many. He said this cup represented the New Testament in his blood. It's a wheel of the Testament. This is the sealing of the deal of the redemption of mankind. It's on in the garden, in Pallas, Paul, in, in Herod's palace, on the streets of Jerusalem. The beating, Yalgotha, the cross, his blood splattered everywhere as he was mistreated. All over the place, he was hurt and wounded. His blood was shed for the forgiveness of the sins of mankind. And Lord, we thank you that you gave your blood for us. We thank you that your life was poured out, that you died, that we might live, that you might live through us. Lord, you're calling us to the crucified life. Lord, that we would die to self and that you would become positioned on the throne of our hearts, so to speak. And we give our lives wholly and fully to you because you gave your life wholly and fully for us. We thank you for your blood that paid the price of our sins. We ask you to bless this juice to our soul, body, mind, and spirit. We thank you, Lord. And we look forward to your soon return. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you guys on Facebook and YouTube. If I can help you know the Lord or help you in any way, you let me know. God bless you.